welcome to Weir First Baptist as folks gather to worship as we honor Christ and as we give glory to God and as we seek to serve the community in the name of Jesus. We're so glad that you're here. So glad that you're here. We know that you have choices to go and worship anywhere. We have many choices in Waitsboro. Thank you for choosing to come here and be part of our worshiping family this morning. We pray that God will touch your heart, will feed your spirit, will allow you to uh, sense the Holy Spirit as he has a message for you in your heart this morning. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, one, we have deacon's meeting tomorrow night. We have a brief finance meeting right after church today, and then we have our uh, fellowship meal and business meeting on Wednesday. And if you've not signed up, please email, call, uh, or put something in the in the offering trays as you're leaving today as well to let us know so we can do the head count. But also to uh, remind you that the Poinsettia order forms are ready for you and uh, make sure that you order ahead of time and fill that out so Kim will be able to know. I guess you are managing that whole thing, right? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bibbidi bobbidi boo, you've just been anointed, so <laughs> well, so glad. At this time, though, we just want to say uh, to our veterans, this has been Veterans Week, Veterans Day this week, and just say thank you for your service. Uh, if you've served in one of our branches of military, would you raise your hand real high? If you are, thank you. And we're just so thankful for you and uh, shared a picture on, on Facebook this week with my own little, little uh, veteran as well. So just, it's near and dear to our hearts and just want to say thank you at this special time. At this time, let's focus our hearts and lives on Christ who has brought us together for this time of worship. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Almighty God, thank you for the joy and the celebration that is worship because you are worthy of our acknowledgement, worthy of our praise, worthy of all that can come up out of us in glorifying you for who you are and not just what you've done to sustain us and create us and redeem us. So Lord, let this time be a reflection of our true selves before you. That as we come into your presence, that we may truly know that it is a safe place because you loved us first. And we thank you and we praise you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. If you're able, please stand with me as we sing hymn number 461.
times when we're in church, we get a little hungry. Do y'all ever get hungry in church? Amen. You do? Yeah. <laughs> you so what I did is I brought some snacks. Okay, I'm going to show you what I've got. I've got five pieces of bread. You see? You see? Five pieces of bread and two goldfish. You see? <laughs> so I thought what I could do, since I brought snacks, is I could share them with everybody. What do you think? Do you think we could use our five pieces of bread and our two goldfish and share with everybody? I don't know. Let's see, we have more children than that, and we've got everybody out here in the congregation that we need to feed. This is going to be tough, isn't it? We only have five pieces of bread and two fish. Well, this reminds me of a story in the Bible. There was one day in the Bible, Jesus was he was talking to some people. 5,000 people. That's a lot of people. That's way, 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 way more than the people here today. He was there with his disciples, his friends. So he's preaching to all these people and talking to them. And like we are right now, everybody gets a little bit hungry. So his friends say, the disciples, they say, Jesus, let's send all these people home. we got to go get some food. And do you know what Jesus says? them have hungry. We need to feed them. So none of the disciples have any food. His friends, they have no food. So they look around the crowd and they say, does anybody have any food? And there was one little boy. And do you know what the little boy had? He had five loaves of bread and two fish. Kind of like what we've got here, right? Five pieces of bread and two fish. And the disciples, I know, it doesn't seem like enough, right? And the disciples said, Jesus, this is not going to work. We don't have enough food. And do you know what Jesus said? He said, oh, you just wait. We're going to feed everybody here. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So what we're going to do is we're going to go downstairs to Children's Church, and we're going to figure out how in the world Jesus was able to feed 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fish. Does that sound good? Okay. Let's say a little prayer, and then we'll go downstairs and figure this out, okay? All right. Dear Jesus, thank you for using the lunch of one little boy to feed more than 5,000 people. And thank you for using these children here today to bless everyone they meet every day. Amen. All right, let's go downstairs.
fire beautifully done. This morning is the culmination of a, a long week of a variety of experiences here in the church. We have had a lot of severe illnesses, life-changing decisions for some families, uh, hospital moments, times of tearful uh, wrangling with what to do next kinds of decisions. Um, and then this past Wednesday afternoon, I just had to get on the water and reflect a little bit. Look at the changing season, the, the flurry of God's handiwork and the beautiful leaves. And it, to me, it was a peak day for the season because Morrow Mountain was a fire with orange and reds. And, and I rented out the whole lake for, just for Carla. No one else was there and I said, you like this? You like this? This is great. Speaking of which, last week when I told you that I've been cutting bushes and limbs and doing all this, <clears throat> she was not sitting inside watching football. She was dragging limbs. And I just want to clarify that for my bride, that she was every step of the way working with me, as well as checking on her old reprobate husband. But then the week was back in full swing, preparing for another life-changing event here in our church as John and Rachel began their new life together. And as we are awaiting news of a new life in the Scarborough family, highs and lows, moments of celebration and joy at the same time that people are weeping. And sometimes it's just an emotional stretch going between these moments. And as I was thinking about this, I had, to, I had this gift um, of time with Fred Center, who was here for the wedding. And Fred and I actually had more time yesterday than we did at, at your house. And we were sitting in the office and we were talking about uh, marriage and ministry and life and weddings. And uh, even though he's older than I am by a couple of years, I've had more weddings than him. We, we were talking about weddings and preparing Iowa. And we were talking about the, uh, how did you, I'm a little over 600 weddings now in 40 years of ministry. And how does that happen? I said, well, when you, when you move around the state of South Carolina and you have youth groups everywhere, and then you go into higher education and you serve at Presbyterian College and then a law school and then at Wingate University, and then you have these mission camps that you've run for 20 years called Saukahatchee Summer Service where you have 100 kids every year. You end up marrying a lot of people. And then there are the friends of friends that want to get married because they came to a service that I'd done and say, oh my goodness, would you do our wedding next year? And so it just sort of piled in. But Fred and I were just talking about how over the years that he was, a, he was an army chaplain, he was a chaplain in the military, how sometimes weddings fall into two categories. There are holy moments and holy ceremonies, and thankfully yesterday was one, and then there are favors. Things that you get asked to do as a favor of, of a friend. But we were talking about marriage as well. And how he and Martha had been married so many years and how over time how these things uh, take place in your life that change you and, and shape you and, and you become friends over the years. And because a lot of the things that first drew you together no longer work. I'll just leave it with that. <laughs> but at the heart of it, if you share faith and friendship, it'll get you through. 
even when the times change, even when the, the things that don't work, there's a deeper work. And he and I share too that when I'm meeting with a couple and we're doing the work of shaping their, their wedding ceremony, for me, over the years, it's taken a place because I don't want to just do favorite weddings. I want this to be the launching pad for a marriage. And so I have deep conversations with couples that center around what are the core values that they want to reflect publicly as they declare to each other and they declare to the world, here, is those, here are those core values on which we are going to build our marriage. So I take them through a series of exercises and homework things. But one of those, one of those things, and Fred and I were talking about this, and he had the good fortune of meeting Gary Chapman, and had come to his church in High, in High Point. Gary Chapman and his partner had, had worked on this book that was the culmination of over 20-something years of Christian counseling and counseling with couples because there are far more people who are wanting to become uncoupled than I would be than those who are wanting to couple together. And the distillation of their work culminated in a book called The Five Love Languages. And it's a great book and it's one I wish it, I'd had early in my, my first marriage, but it wasn't in existence. But I used their principles in preparing couples, not just for their wedding, but for their marriage. And the five love languages, as Fred and I were talking about that, we, we understand, and he knows, and I know from experience, that one of the things that we look for in getting married is a concept I've called belonging, which I've changed that word in preparing with, with couples to a homework that says I need blank to be safe in my marriage. Think about the things that you, you can see in your own heart that you feel like keep you safe. What concepts, what building blocks would you say you try to build around you to make you feel safe? And often, it's, it's a, a common theme in the homework of couples with whom I work when I get them to complete this exercise, I need blank to be safe in my marriage. There are common themes of financial security, honesty, open communication. But often when I follow up in a, in a work with a couple, it comes out more like forgiveness. I need forgiveness. I need to be able to be accepted, flaws and all, to be saved in my marriage. Another word for that is I need some space, somewhere. I need the security of knowing that I belong. And I think that's something that we all seek for in some, some way or another, a way of belonging. Knowing that we are accepted for who we are, for where we've been. I'm a big fan of uh, Brene Brown. And if you've never seen any of her TED Talks or Google her, any of her talks, I highly recommend, recommend that you go to watch Renee Brown. She's a leading expert on one of the issues that is a block or an obstacle to belonging in relationships, and that is shame. Shame. Most of us think of guilt. I've done something that I perceive or know is wrong, and I've crossed some sacred boundary. I've taken something. I've received something, I've done something, that in my code of ethics and my boundaries I say, I cross that line and I feel guilt. Shame. 
Shame is when guilt starts transferring to something I've done to being expressed as who I am. That I'm not worthy. And shame typically is, some, is like a blanket under which we hide. I'm going to cover up so that no one really sees my true self. And Brene Brown puts it this way. True belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world. Our sense of belonging, and this is, this is kind of a, the takeaway from this morning as, I, as, I, as we talk together and I preach God's word. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. Most of you in here have heard me preach and teach ad nauseum, ad infinitum about going through divorce, and those periods in my life. And, and for those of you who are visiting or joining us digitally, I just want to touch base on that again because when I was going through those periods of darkness of divorce and lawsuit that came years later the blanket of shame I put around myself was to hide my true self and authentic flaws from anybody because I needed in my own life to feel like I needed to belong, but I don't want you to really see me. I don't want you to really see my wounds. I don't want you to really see my pain. I don't want you to really see who I am authentically because they might not accept me. When we don't understand the acceptance that God's leading us to, shame shows up in our lives in a variety of ways. We will try to manipulate other people into liking us. I can't tell you the number of years right after the divorce that I would spend more concerned about how other people thought about me more than what I was trying to lean into God's acceptance. And I've seen this in church, I've seen it in work, I've seen it everywhere where we get more concerned about being liked by other people and spending an inordinate amount of time trying to get other people like us, even through manipulation or triangulation or gossip or whatever it is we need to do to make ourselves a feeling of acceptance because we really don't accept ourselves. So if I, I'm desperate, I'm desperate to have other people accept me. And that never looks good, does it? I remember when I shifted into higher education ministry and in the new field of fundraising and that, that sense of shame and want, want other people to accept me but to stay hidden behind that, that cloak and that safety so that people wouldn't see that I wasn't an expert yet. I was that guy that everybody hates in their workplace. You know the person who shows up at a meeting and tries to be the smartest person in the room? <laughs> and your coworkers go, oh, God, will he ever shut up? <laughs> but really it was a source of shame. It was, it was really me desperately trying to be accepted and raise my hand emotionally to go, look at me, look at me, I'm worthy. I, I really do know what I'm talking about. Look at me, I, please accept me. And that's all it is. It's a function of shame. When we desperately are seeking approval, Psalm 63 says this. Oh God, think of this as even your prayer this morning. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My 
My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. A dry and thirsty land. Where there's no water. So I will look for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. I will bless you while I live, and I will lift up my hands in your name. I remember going to church, and I was feeling that sense of hiding. I remember going to church, and Carl and I go, and the pastor would get on something about divorce, or get on something about failure in marriage, or failure in some sacred line. And I remember those times where I couldn't even sit in church without just crying. I wanted to escape somehow. I didn't want to show my flaws. I didn't want to show that I was vulnerable and human at all. And I would, I would just cry because there was this sense of shame. David wrote this. David wrote these words. David, who had committed adultery. David, who was a murderer. And maybe this morning you have felt like you've been in a dry and thirsty land. Maybe you've been hiding under some kind of cloak of, I don't want people to see who I am, my flaws and all. Maybe that dry and thirsty land is your soul this morning. Maybe you've been living in some kind of shame. Maybe you've been desperate to have people accept you for who you are. Maybe you have stuff that you're just wanting to hide David calls out in this psalm and he calls out to you and to me and he says, friend, think of this as a, a letter written personally to you. Friend, flawed and, and wounded as you are, God's acceptance is better than life. Quit trying to chase human acceptance around every tree, every corner. Every club, every workspace. Because God's acceptance is better than life. Oh my word, I wish I could have heard that sooner and appropriated that in my life sooner. David wrote this psalm. In Psalm 51, you'll find what appears to be David's confession psalm after he had been outed for his adultery. And we see in that psalm a reflection here that God's acceptance to David was greater than his own reputation as king. Oh, friend, that, that one was one that almost kept me in bondage even longer. That I would be more con concerned about my reputation and what other people may think of me if I, if I raised my hand in worship or if I sat quietly and, and prayed and cried about my longing for belonging. Or as the old country song said, looking for love in all the wrong places. His loving kindness is better than life. One of the things that I need to just say bluntly is The church, the church that I see God is trying to make of us is to be a sanctuary. A safe place where we can share the vulnerability of who we are. Gay, straight, divorced, seeking, trying to figure it out, trying to look and see where we are a people Black, white, brown, yellow. But I know that in my own walk, in my own struggle, one of the things that became powerful to me was when 
somebody when I shared and I, I, I risked the vulnerability of taking my shame blanket off and I had a brother say, me too. People have made a lot of fun of the Me Too movement and, and made a lot of things in that that have not been kind. But you know how much courage it takes for somebody to come forward and say, I was sexually abused or I was sexually assaulted or I was raped when this was happening. And then people say, oh, it's just a political movement. No, I want to say this is something that, that David was even saying, hey, you struggling? You've had things happen to you. <sighs> Me too. And I can tell you, friends, personally, that having someone say, hey, this is this is not your, you're not the only one who's struggling. You're not the only one who's vulnerable. You're not the only one who's lonely. You're not the only one who's looking for belonging. You're not the only one who's acting a fool trying to, to be all that in a bag of chips to cover your own insecurities. safe. If nobody sees me, I'm, 
I'm saved. Are you going to allow God to teach you and accept you for who you are? To tell you that you belong? I am more free today than I've ever been in my life. I don't care what people think about me anymore. Because all I care about is what he thinks about me. And when that becomes our driving interest and our driving motivation to say, God, I want that acceptance. I want that belonging. I just want to be safe in your presence. Lee, as people reflect and pray,
this place know that he's not done with you. He has not finished. There's more to you than just meets the, the past, the light of day. Come into the light. Come into the fullness of God's acceptance and his, his offer of belonging.